Hey, uh, welcome back and uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, and uh, Sasha is going to give the, the second talk uh, on robust stochastics and uncertainty. Yeah, thanks for coming back. Um, I guess I didn't scare you enough. Uh, um, so uh, we left off with uh, the following statement that if you look at the SGD as a way to solve the IID problem, the, you know, the, the, the problem of minimizing uh, expected loss, then uh, at the end of the day, we're going to be bounding deterministically uh, the following objective. And, and, and uh, I, I've written it here. So in, in fact, let me give a name to this objective um, or, or to this uh, uh, process. Uh, and and uh, it's going to be called online linear optimization, so online linear optimization. And it's, it's uh, you know, nothing fancy. So for t from 1 to n, we uh, predict or choose, you know, the choose uh, w hat t and then observe uh, uh, in that notation nabla t. And that's it, right? So that, that's, the, uh, that's the process. Think of this as a game, and, and in fact, we're going to be writing these as games later. Um, uh, and uh, the goal is to have small 1 over n sum of w hat t minus w star. Um, in, in fact, for any w, let's say. So for any uh, w in some set f, we want the, the suboptimality nabla t to be less than something, and this something is called the regret bound. Okay, so that's the kind of the that's the word that I'm going to use. This is a regret bound. So how much we're uh, uh, um, how much we regret or not regret uh, not using not knowing the optimal w, right? Now, what what uh, the the feature of this online linear optimization framework is that we will require the statement to hold for any sequence of uh, a, a nabla t that live in some set. Okay, so we can't let them be completely arbitrary, but uh, if they live in some set, they're bounded in some dual norm, let's say, then we want uh, the statement to hold for any sequence, right? And that's essentially what, uh, what we're proving. And if you look at even, you know, like Nemirovsky uh, notes, uh, he always says that these gradients can come from an arbitrary field. They don't have to be uh, necessarily uh, gradients of some function, right? This statement can be proved uh, uh, for arbitrary sequence. <coughs> so he just here is the proof, right? It's two lines. You write the w hat t plus 1 minus w. Uh, that's the projection. Of course, it's closer than the unprojected version, right? Then uh, uh, you open up the square. You get these terms. Hopefully, I did it correctly. Uh, and then you rearrange. That's the object you want, right? That's the uh, inner product that you want. You put it on the left side. These differences telescope when you add them up over time. And so you get the statement. Then if you chose step size optimally, you would get the 1 over square root of n rate times the diameter of the, uh, of the set f times the size of maximal size of the gradients, right? So that's a kind of a trivial uh, uh, um, uh, trivial result, right? Okay, so that gives you this one over square root of n, and 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 the point here is that you know that's the same result that we've got for the empirical risk minimization, uh, except we never had to go through uniform convergence, right? And so so the the, the puzzle here uh, is is did we avoid somehow uniform convergence, or, or is it hidden somewhere? And, 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 and the answer is that there, there is a deep, an, a deep kind of uh, uh, answer to that. And, and that's, uh, uh, there is some uniform convergence. Uh, and the, fa the very fact that we are able to prove convergence of gradient descent uh, um, means that there is a, some existence, uh, implies existence of some strongly convex function. And that uh, is related to uniform convergence uh, uh, for Martingales uh, over so that's so that, that's just uh, for uh, I guess experts maybe I shouldn't go in that direction um, so it, no we didn't we didn't avoid completely the uh, the uniform uh, deviations right it's just hidden in a different place but uh, but, an but another question that's kind of uh, 
the, the suggest is, you know, is this possible? Is it possible that we can actually get the data dependent uh, Rademacher bound, right? That, that, that depends on the sequence of the uh, gradients, right? Remember the sequence of the gradients for the loss functions, uh, the loss function is the absolute value of y minus wx for our example. And so the gradient of that loss is proportional to xt, right? So when I say uh, empirical Rademacher complexity, it would be essentially xt, the, the nabla would be xt times some uh, 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 real value, right? So it's essentially the, the, the empirical Rademacher complexity that we had from, the, from before. Um, the answer to this is actually we, we, we don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm suggesting that we, we know, but we actually don't know for the online linear optimization where, where, when this is true. But uh, there will be another scenario that I will uh, briefly, uh, that I will shortly describe in which we do know that, you know, when this is possible. And in fact, that scenario is more interesting than this one. Sasha? Yes? Is, is that somehow because there's no distribution on the, on the nablas in this? Yeah, the, 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 this would be very surprising, right? Because there, there, is no, uh, uh, there is no distribution anywhere, right? right. This is a, a statement completely deterministic two lines to prove, right, that holds for all sequences. So why would this be the case, right? Okay, so uh, as you were saying, it seems crazy to think that, you know, statistical quantities such as these empirical Rademacher complexity would, should govern regret of a completely deterministic quantity that holds for all sequences. Or is it? So let me give you a, a, an example uh, where, in fact, uh, uh, we, we, know, we know that it is true. So consider again the set F from which the Ws come equal to the set X from which the covariates come. Uh, that's the unit uh, Euclidean ball. And consider a projected gradient descent. And the only thing that we're going to change is that the step size is this adaptive step size. Okay, it's, just, it's one over square root of the gradients that you've seen so far. Okay. Um, then uh, a variant of the two-line proof that I showed uh, gives the following inequality, the following regret inequality. Again, for any sequence of nablas, the, you know, the, the, the regret bound can be written in terms of the nablas itself. I think it's somewhere in Nimirovsky, probably. You don't even use integrability. Uh, uh, or, or deterministic, deterministic. But these are arbitrary vectors. They arbitrary don't vectors. They don't have to be gradients of anything. Yes, yes. <coughs> okay, this is easy to prove. And if you know uh, Hinchin Kahain inequality, it is an upper. It is upper bounded by the uh, uh, expected norm of, of, of the Rademacher. Averages, which is the Rademacher, yeah, the, 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 these are the empirical Rademacher averages, right? So there is one case, I guess this is Adagrad, right? Maybe. This is one of the versions of Adagrad. Um, um, uh, we, we do have a case where there is a, some completely deterministic statement that holds for all sequences of nablas, right? With that recurrence update, you get the empirical Rademacher complexity. Any questions? I just make a comment. Yes. Because it does seem mysterious that that could be ever possible. Yes. But like you said it in the beginning, right? The expectation, like if you think about that with Gaussians, well, now this is just like a mean width. Yes. Right? And so it's, it's actually geometric. It's not. Simple. It is geometric. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, and, and it's perhaps mystery can be taken out of this as if you think of some geometric quantities. And of course, uh, both behavior of random walks, you know, behavior of martingales are strongly related to the geometry. And geometry is related to optimization, so it's not crazy to think that you can close the loop and, and, and talk about the. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. right. And it's also clear that uh, empirical Rademacher, at least the expected empirical Rademacher, would be a. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Empirical Rademacher would be a lower bound on this uh, online linear optimization problem, because if you just present coin flip times the gradient, uh, t t sorry, t t coin flip times the nabla, then in expectation, the first term is zero, obviously. 
and uh, you get the, well, there should be an expectation here uh, over the epsilons, and that's exactly the uh, empirical Rademacher, right? So that's also a lower bound. So up to a constant, this is, you know, for the L2, L2 geometry, that's the best you can do. Yes. Yeah, so, so the the so the question is, uh, uh, can we get uh, this Rademacher upper bound for uh, a different geometry using mirror descent? And the answer is uh, not really, because this, if you know about you know, Banach spaces, this is a, a, a statement about cotype, and so you would lose here very badly in terms of dimension and, and other things, possibly even the rate if you want to keep the. Um, dimension free result. Okay. But just for a plug for experts. Okay. But, but, but of course, this you can get with uh, mirror descent, right? So there is adaptive version of mirror descent that gives uh, 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 this with an with a appropriate norm as long as you can find a strongly convex function, which means that the, uh, um, you have to smooth the norm, right? Potentially. Okay, all right, so, so let me step back. What is the grand goal? Um, the grand goal is we started with IID data. We looked at the matrix prediction example. It's a bad assumption for matrix completion. Uh, we went ahead with that assumption and saw that the empirical Rademacher averages is the right bound for the performance of both SGD and the uh, uh, ERM. Then we saw that in that proof of SGD, there is something hidden there that's completely deterministic. And now the question is, can we actually get rid of the random XY and say that we're going to have some result for all pairs XY, right? And that would be very uh, uh, um, uh, you know, interesting for the matrix completion, for instance. It will have some kind of robustness result, right, for individual sequences. Of course, it means that we'll have to work much harder to, to do that. Um, so what are we going to do? So let me introduce, instead of a online linear optimization, let me introduce a slightly different setting, uh, which I think is more interesting. And, and, and kind of this, this setting is not itself interesting. It's, it's only interesting as, as a step, you know, as, as a stepping uh, uh, stone to something else, right? Um, so here is the setting. Uh, we'll have an interaction that lasts, lasts for n rounds. On each round, we observe some covariates, xt. Uh, we make a prediction. Let's, let's say it's a bounded between minus 1 and 1 for the y variable. And then we observe the actual the, the, the outcome, right? This is going to be called online supervised learning, as opposed to online linear optimization, right? Slightly different setting. The goal is to have small error relative to this f, as before. Uh, except here, we have our prediction minus the outcome as the loss, right? Versus the benchmark. And we would like to have this result for all sequences. Right? Is, is this possible? Well, I didn't say what the result is, but we want to upper bound this for all sequences, right? We want to develop a strategy such that our loss is uh, as good as the benchmark. And hopefully, it's just enough to assume that y's are close to w times xt in, you know, most of the time. But no iid assumption, right? So is, is that clear? We want to get rid of the iid assumption and get a result for all sequences. And the result will only be interesting if our hunch is correct that the y's are explained by a linear function of the x's, right? And so we only want to do as well as the benchmark. And this was the case with uh, statistical learning as well, right? We had this minimum over uh, a, a linear predictors, except we had, uh, we had the IID assumption, right? So why is this learning? Let me explain. Well, it is learning because you're making out of sample predictions, right? It's not just fitting the data. It is about prediction. You're making a prediction y hat t for this individual 
before observing the label for that individual, right? So let, let's think of matrix completion, right? X's are the user movie pair. So at each round, you observe a user movie pair, and you have to make a prediction whether they will like that movie or they, they will not like that movie. And I'm allowing kind of a mixed strategy. You can think of this as a, the mean of the uh, of a, a random variable, OK? And, and, and that's, that's what we're going to pay, right? Yes. So if you do something like if you put sine, you know, sine of inner product of W and XT. Yes. So how much does that change the problem here? Then it seems to yes. bump into like hardness of exactly. agnostically yes. Yes. aspect. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I will, you're jumping one slide ahead of me. Uh, uh, so Ankur asked what, uh, if you put uh, a sign here, what will happen? And uh, uh, give me just a couple of minutes. And in particular, what I would like to do is to, uh, to see whether we can get an empirical Rademacher complexity. This is a, a difficult goal. And so I'm not sure I'm actually going to get to it. But I, I can give a pointer uh, to a paper that at least says, you know, under these conditions, this is possible. Yes? Is it clear? I mean, uh, can you give an example where? Uh, you know, having yt being a real valued number between minus one and one would actually help over plus minus ones. Um, some... Why it would help? It 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 helps algorithmically because we we you know that, that that's a that becomes a, a nicer problem to solve, and I'm doing here it for simplicity as well. Um, but you can think of this as a kind of the mean of the strategy, right? And 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 so. Now think of log loss, right? A, a, a logarithmic loss. You you put down a distribution and you pay minus log of the probability that you put on the outcome, right? It, it has the same feel, except it's a you know absolute value of the difference. So think of y hat as the probability. You can pay from zero to uh, to one, right? For for being or to two for being, for being different, right? Okay, so uh, once again, uh, uh, kind of going to back to Blackwell, uh, this is going one layer ab above what, what what he was doing in terms of introducing the covariates, which is the interesting uh, part. But uh, again, we will have to work harder to to realize the uh, same result without the IID assumption, right? That's the goal. Um, and and let me say that th this connection between the ability to get the results similar to what you get in the IID setting uh, or in stochastic setting. Uh, but for individual sequences, this connection has been noticed by many people in, the, in, in different communities. And this one is from information theory, kind of a, a classical paper by Merhav and Feder and universal prediction. Loosely speaking, there is a strong duality between the probabilistic and deterministic setting, where you assume that data comes from some source. For them, actually, it's not necessarily IID. And the deterministic, where you want something for all sequences. While in the former, you make a certain assumptions on the data sequences that you are likely to encounter, uh, but no limitation on the class of prediction algorithms. And the latter, it's the, way, the, the other way around. So uh, I just want to point, point out that you know, uh, many times in the literature, this has been noted. But there hasn't been really a crisp uh, understanding of why uh, this is happening. OK, and now, now uh, uh, back to An Ankur's uh, uh, question. Do we always expect that IID results will coincide with something for individual sequences? And the answer is actually no. So this is not something that you should necessarily expect. And, and there, there are examples where it's not possible. And, and, and here's the example uh, where the, when the separation appears, you take the loss function to be the indicator loss. Okay, So think the pack. Uh, setting uh, in the IID case. Uh, if you take thresholds, so these are just uh, on, on, a, on a line, x is a, a real uh, uh, variable, uh, and this is a threshold parameterized by theta. Uh, that has VC dimension 1, if you know what that is. Uh, if, if not, all it means is that the empirical risk minimization can still be possible. Um, uh, or, or, or still has the rate of convergence of 1 over square root of n, right? So you still have this expected loss of the uh, uh, empirical risk minimizer compared to the best in hindsight is 1 over square root of n. Uh, and yet there is no way to get our individual sequence result. 
There is no way, there is no ra randomized or deterministic method that will give you the analog of the average uh, number of mistakes minus the best uh, given by some best threshold, uh, better than the constant, maybe one half or, or one, I don't remember the constant. Okay. And, and, and again, there is a deeper connection. Uh, uh, I can point to a paper uh, with Karthik Zitharan on Martingale extensions of Wapnik Chervenikis theory. And it is just a question of Martingale uniform convergence versus IID uniform convergence. And as soon as you have a gap, you will have a gap here as well. So for linear, the, the essentially no gap. So you would have to work very hard to find a space where Martingales behave differently from um, IID. Um, the difficulty here is really in this um, infinite precision of the, uh, of the adversary, that he can choose sequences just around the threshold. And in fact, what we showed is that if you, uh, if, if the adversary, if you think of these sequences as being generated by adversary, if the hand of the adversary trembles, um, even with uh, you know, exponentially small size, you get back to the IID kind of setting. So it's really kind of a, it's really this discontinuity of the indicator loss that's uh, 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 kind of a trouble. But well, you might imagine in higher dimensions, this gap could get pretty nasty. Uh, possibly, yes. Yeah, the, the results are rather limited on kind of um, on characterizing um, classes of functions you know, beyond just saying that uniform convergence happens. Um, but, but, but again, so, so I just want to maybe spend uh, two minutes that this is a, has deeper connections to perceptron. Um, for those of you who don't know what perceptron is, um, you know, this is the beginning of machine learning. Right. So, so in uh, 57, 59, uh, Rosenblatt introduced the perceptron, which is, you know, you have a sequence x1, y1, uh, and so forth, right? xn, yn, um, and, and maybe longer. Uh, and uh, the problem is like this. For t from 1 to n, you uh, observe xt. You predict uh, y hat t in plus minus one, and then uh, uh, um, you observe the yt in plus minus one. And uh, if there is a mistake, uh, you actually update. So these predictions are made by, not arbitrarily, but in a proper manner. They're made by uh, um, uh, w hat t is a sine of w t, let's say, hat times x t. So you, you, you make predictions according to your current uh, hyperplane, and then you update the hyperplane. So if there is a mistake, then you correct your hyperplane. t plus 1 is w hat t plus y t x t. Right. And, 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 um, there is no step size here because you can rescale everything. The data are separable. Uh, and so there, there is a reason why you don't need the step size here, or it wouldn't change anything. So then uh, uh, Novikov proved um, that the, if data are separable, separable uh, with a margin. So what is margin? Uh, there exists a W star such that y i times w x i is larger than gamma um, and the norm w star and the norm of w star is uh, one. You have to rescale, uh, renormalize, you know, something. So you you, you uh, if if there exists a uh, a unit uh, um, direction that separates the data by gamma, um, then the number of mistakes, number of corrections, is at most 
uh, the radius of the data squared, so the radius of the x's divided by gamma squared. Right? So that's the uh, uh, perceptron mistake bound. And this was essentially the, the beginning of um, machine learning, right? And it gave rise to these, what, was, what Wapnik was referring to, at least in the, uh, in the Soviet Union, as the, as the, you know, the study of, online, of, of methods um, uh, that would produce uh, uh, you know, learning pattern recognition uh, machines. Um, and and uh, uh, this is a paper uh, from 68, um, just before Vapnik and Chervenenkis um, came up with their sour shellach lemma, I guess Vapnik Chervenenkis sour shellach lemma, uh, if you know what, what it is. Uh, so this is for the experts. Um, and then they have this kind of uh, interesting paragraph. They say, uh, either you can you know, get this result that does not depend on the dimension of the space and then convert it into the IID result, right? This holds for all sequences, then you say, oh, but my sequences were IID, and therefore you can get a, a rate of convergence for the expected loss in terms of something that depends on the margin but not on the dimension of the data. Or you can go through the uh, VC type of analysis where you get the VC dimension in there, uh, and that's dimension of the space. So uh, there's a clearly two different ways of getting the result, uh, and, and they were wondering why there are two different ways of getting the result. And now we know that um, because of the previous slide, for thresholds, it's not possible to do something for all sequences. You can only get it for sequences that are separable, right? And the result that you get is, 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 is at least in that uh, 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 statement, is in terms of the margin. Uh, but for IID, uh, data, you can get a result for all distributions, and that just depends on the uh, dimension of the space, right? So there are two ways of gaining, uh, doing it, and, and they, they, uh, uh, th they're different, right? So that, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. So w uh, why is this online linear optimization interesting? Well, because if you can solve the online linear optimization, then it, you can use it for the online supervised learning problem that I outlined before, right? Online supervised learning, again, is you observe the, the x, the covariate, you make a prediction, and then you observe the outcome. And how do you do it? You do it in the proper, what's called the proper learning ways. You, you update the gradients as a projected gradient, um, uh, but then you, uh, um, the gradient that you feed into the online linear optimization is the gradient of the loss function, right? So, if you can solve this, then you can solve online uh, uh, supervised learning problem, right? So that's hopefully clear, just by convexity. However, um, uh, this is not necessarily the best idea. Um, why? So first of all, this is a proper learning method in the sense that you actually look at the, uh, you work with the space of Ws, and you, you, you have a, a solution that's consistent, or, or sorry, you have a solution uh, um, uh, that's within the class of models, uh, whereas the online supervised learning framework here just asks for a number, to predict a number, and that's potentially a much simpler optimization problem. And in fact, it can circumvent certain hardness results uh, uh, if you look at it this way rather than online uh, linear optimization way. Okay. Okay, so, so what, uh, you know, if you were lost in the last couple of slides, let me bring you back. Uh, I'm going to give you a sense of how online supervised learning and online linear optimization can be solved through dynamic programming. And, and hopefully this will give you a sense uh, of um, why something can hold for arbitrary sequences, right, for all sequences. Why you can get a result that does not depend on the uh, IID nature of the data. And this is through the dynamic programming. So uh, to make it very simple, I'm going to throw away the x's. We're in a setting where you make a prediction y hat t in the real line, and then you observe a binary outcome. So uh, I, I'm simpl simplifying it even more because I'm not restricting your prediction to be in the plus minus one interval, just to make the recursion simpler. Okay. Now. 
one way to write the optimization problem is that I want to minimize over the space of strategies, prediction strategies, such that for any sequence, I have some prediction performance, right? All you can say, right? You know, you can you can you can write any problem in this way, right? So whenever whenever you want to develop a method that will work for this class of problems, you can always write, uh, you know, minimum over algorithms, maximum over problems, the performance of the algorithm on the problem. So you haven't done anything, but it turns out that because it's a sequential prediction problem, it actually decomposes into a bunch of smaller uh, uh, dynamic programming steps, and that's key. So something that looks horrible when you write it that, like that becomes actually simple as when you consider it uh, stage-wise. Okay, the particular form that we will consider is average of the losses, right? So think of this as y hat t minus yt, for instance, minus, well, something about the, some phi function of the sequence, and I'm doing it purely for, uh, Syntactic for, for notational purposes, uh, it can be any. In, in, in fact, it can be any phi function. But you know, you think of this phi function. It's the minimum over some vector of the loss uh, of of that vector for this, or the best vector for that sequence. Okay, does that make sense? So this is the benchmark that we wanted to compare against, right? I remember the, the online, I go back, right, Th this is the benchmark. And so I'm gonna call this phi. Uh, uh, what's important is that this part does not depend on our decisions, on our predictions, that's key. That's key to solving this dynamic program efficiently. Um, I'm going to add some constant c. That's going to be important later. For now, it's just some constant. Uh, what I want to say is that if we prove that this is upper bounded by 0, this min max upper bounded by 0, then we've got the individual sequence prediction result, right? OK, and maybe it's not obvious, so let me, let me make sure that everyone understands this. Um, yes, question. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Why is it okay for phi to sort of have nothing to do with L? Well, nothing to do with the y hat t's? Or with L, you said phi can be sort of anything? Um, because the proof will go, will go through for any phi, and it's, it's just easier to, to write it in terms of phi, but if you want, think of phi as being equal to that, if you would like. Yeah, you can. No, I, was, I guess the other thing is like, not all fees are this the same. You have to pick a good one, otherwise you have to pick a good one. Yeah. You get, you get so you want to think that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So think, yeah. think, think this, yeah, okay. yeah. Right. But you're saying some of the dynamic program is going to be general enough. General enough that will right exactly right right. So the question is, you know, why is it a uh, why, why why do we write general fee just for notation purposes? It's going to be simpler, right? But yeah, the proof will work for any fee, uh, but you can think of this particular fee. I think that something that's actually non-trivial, I guess, is, is, and I want to make sure that everyone understands this, is if we can ensure that this is upper bounded by zero, then we have this result that we want. That for all sequences, there are no x's because I threw them out, right? So for all, it's just the y sequence, right? Um, the number of mistakes is upper bounded by this phi function. In fact, let me go back to the uh, Blackwell example, right? We're predicting a sequence. It was a 0, 1 sequence. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, and we would like to do as well as the proportion of 1s and the proportion of minus 1s, or proportion of 1s and zeros, the maximum of that, right? Or in terms of mistakes, we want to do not worse than the number of the minimum of the number of 1s and the number of minus 1s in this. So that you can write it, in fact, as, as, as this minimum over two different f's. One is just all zeros, or I guess it's a binary prediction, all minus ones. And the other vector is all ones. And that will exactly give you the objective that you're trying to optimize in that black hole example that we started with, right? So this is easy, to, easy enough to see that 
if we can solve it, it will give the solution to the black hole a problem. Um, yes, you're first. I'm yeah. a little bit confused that uh, in the min-max, it's not capturing that yt is only a function of what you see in the time step t, right? Yes. Uh, it's so, not a game that at every so, step you want to take the worst choice. That, 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 that's actually a good point. So when we uh, write it like this, we write it over a sequence. Um, um, the sequence can be adaptive to our moves, right? And, and so that, that's called adaptive adversary. I, I want to sweep it under the rug for a moment and just say that nothing will change. He's asking the opposite. Your or, notation doesn't suggest that the y hat, like it just, the y hat here seems like it could pick it arbitrarily. Uh, y hats are functions here. Uh, they're functions from the past. It's a strategy, right? So it's a minimum over strategies, right? But, but also you can say the same thing about the adversary and I, now I realize this is bad notation, right? So uh, I'm thinking this of, you know, you can think of this as sequence or strategy for the adversary, uh, and, and this is a, definitely a strategy. So this is definitely not a minimum over predict, yeah, sorry. So but maybe like, it's really like the game notation, right? There's a min yes. max, min max. Exactly, right, right, exactly, yes. How much are we flexible in the choice of the objective function of the game? Rather than like the regret game, can we just replace the like, indicator that the average loss is smaller than the fee? That's like, uh, But it's a multi-stage game, right? So we'll have to roll even, back. Even the offline version, like, do we need to pick like exactly regret? Can we think of like weird functions? Yeah, so you can, uh, you can think uh, it, it, everything will be much harder, right? So I, I'm, I'm actually... Just for the illustration purposes, let me actually pick this loss, right? It's, it's, you might say it's not natural. I just want to show why Rademacher appears, right? That, and, and this will be very simple. What about the uh, objective function of the game, the regrets yes. function? Yes. So, so you, replace that with something you can consider with something other, yeah. You, you can replace it with something other than uh, just the average of the losses, yes. So if you think about, uh, like so there's some. No uh, you can do that as well, uh, or you can consider ca what's called calibration, where you want to predict the weather, uh, and, and and you want to say that you know after 100 days, uh, my frequency of predicting rain, uh, whenever I predicted 20% rain, like on the weather.com, in fact the empirical frequency was 20 close to 20%, so that's called the calibrated uh, forecaster. And that you can also write in this notation. But I guess you're going to use the mean max. Exactly, right. right. So, okay. so that's going to be much more complicated. Right? Quick question. Yes. Uh, so this loss, shouldn't, shouldn't that be minus y hat times y? If this is a loss? Um, I had minus before, and then I switched to, to plus just for illustration purposes. So think of this as a, um, uh, it doesn't matter. You can just put a minus there and it just change the signs later. Yeah. OK, so that, that's the objective. And uh, w uh, in all these problems, what you do is you do the last step. And once you do the last step, it hopefully gives you an idea of how to go back, right? how to roll back. So what do you do at the last step? The y1 through yt, uh, yn minus 1s are fixed. These are fixed numbers. You've observed them. You've, you had your chance to predict them. You did something. They're fixed. What can you do now? So the only thing is, you remains to choose the y hat n, right? And if this were an indicator loss, you would choose a mixed strategy. But because it's a linear loss, uh, you can show that it's enough to have a deterministic choice. Okay. So now uh, you have a minimum, uh, a, a uh, min max, right? So you have to choose a prediction such that for any outcome, you control loss minus the, this phi function, right? So is it clear that this is the objective that you need to solve at the last step, right, to everyone? Uh, there is nothing else you can do, right? That's, that's the one that you need to solve. OK, but it's trivial to solve it. It has a closed form solution. This is a max, so plug in plus 1 here and here, and plug in minus 1 here and here. And now you have a minimum of one with positive slope and one with a negative slope. The minimum is attained at the intersection of these two lines. And you don't have to worry, because I said over R, you don't have to worry about projecting back to you know, a proper interval. And so you just get the closed form strategy. When you plug this back in, 
what is the value that you get of this whole objective? Well, you get minus half of the fee with the plus one and half of the fee with the minus one. Ooh. That's just the expectation of our over a random or random variable, right? So it somehow it appears magically just because you've solved the, 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 the saddle point problem, right? And, and now you roll back. So it's clear that when you uh, do, you know, you, now you think of this as the fee function, the new fee function, you put it back in, solve at an n minus one, and one by one, these guys are gonna turn into the rather macro random variables. And so at the end of the day, you will just get the expected value of the fee function. So visually, what's happening is that you have this recursion, right? You, you, you solve this problem. Once you've solved it, you call this minus phi. And now you solve the previous one, and, and so forth, right? So as long as you can do that uh, in a closed form way, you cannot do it numerically because you, uh, that would blow up the kind of the state space, right? But if, if, if you just the, uh, do it in terms of the kind of functional form, closed form, then you're done. Yes? So now the expectation of the Rademacher variables doesn't come all the way to the outside, right? You uh, it will, just a second. L l let me show. Okay. Um, um, I, I just want to show that what, what we're solving is actually what, what we want to solve. And right, push these guys into the min maxes, right? They're, they're all out here, but you can push, you know, aggregate them together in one place. And so that's going to be this, right? And, and so you can write min max, min max, min max, min max, right? So it's this horrible thing, but it decomposes into much simpler optimization problems. And, and we have this notation where whenever we have things repeated, like min max, or sometimes it's min max expectation or min expectation max, we just have this notation to say that it's repeated. This operator is repeated over time, right? You can think of this as a function of many variables, and now there are the operators like min, max, or expectation that are being applied sequentially to this, uh, 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 to this objective to bring into a different game, right? So you can think of this as transitioning from one game to another game. Okay, and, and that's exactly the mean over algorithms, max over sequences, which hides a lot, right? So when you write it as min max, well, there is no way to optimize it, but when you unroll it uh, uh, um, in, in this notation, it, it, it is solvable. Okay, so the conclusion, remember I said that if we can show that this min max is less than zero, then there exists a strategy, right? Um, now, we showed that the, the whole thing is going to be upper bounded by minus expected phi. So as long as that minus expected phi is, is, low, is upper bounded by zero, we're done. That's equivalent to just checking if the expected phi is above zero, right? That's the, that's the only thing I need to, uh, uh, to check. So the conclusion is that if you can check this, then there is an online algorithm that will attain that. Is this statement clear? And remember, at, at this point, at this point, I, I said that if we can show that this whole thing, min max, is upper bounded by zero, then we have this result. And what we've proved is that this is upper bounded not by zero, but by, by the minus expect, uh, upper bounded by uh, minus expected phi on the, the random coin flips. And so as long as the minus expected phi is upper bounded by zero, we have the result. OK, but let, let's take our favorite function, which is the, the benchmark. It's the minimum over vectors of the, this linear, uh, linear loss. Right? Or you can put minuses again. You can put minuses, everything will, will work out uh, exactly the same way. So what is this constant Cn, right? It's needed. Why is it needed? Because the expected minimum when, you, when y's are epsilons is less than zero, right? It's not more than zero. So when you, when you take the expected minimum of, of this, it's clear that expected minimum is gonna be small, is gonna be upper bounded by minimum of the expectation, and that's zero. So clearly, we need uh, to correct it. So how much do we correct it? Well, it's a closed form. Hey, hey it's a Rademacher. Right? The Rademacher averages just fall out uh, um, in, in this way. Right? 
So it, it seems like it's happening for completely different reasons, right? It, 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 it seems that it's happening for reasons that are uh, uh, connected to the optimal, uh, what is the optimal strategy for the adversary maybe, right? The, 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 this min max is solved at the, at, at, at the coin flip, right? Okay, so uh, the, 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 the point here is that yes, there is an online algorithm and you can now recover it, go back and recover it from the solution, right? So uh, um, the, the way that we solve this dynamic program, uh, that guarantees what we what we want. Yes. Um, uh, if this was a k valued, you would get um, like a vector valued Radomacher. So there, there's a generalization to a, like a vector valued Radomacher. Yeah. This is the simplest possible. Yes. Okay, so where can we go from here in the next 10 minutes? So there are two possibilities. One is to go after this problem and show you how things like exponential weights, which some of you maybe have seen, and the gradient descent, dual averaging, arise as, in fact, approximate dynamic programming solutions. Or to put the covariates back into the picture and try to solve the online supervised learning problem, which I think is more interesting, but I would actually go with the first one because it's easier to explain. So let me, in the remaining 12 minutes, uh, uh, show you some of the results. Okay, so what we've shown is that the, for this bit prediction with strange loss, again, just for simplicity, we get the rare macro complexity. Now let's go to the world of, uh, uh, of online linear optimization and see what uh, what's the regret here? What is the upper bound here, right? And, and let me just do the first step with uh, F being the unit ball, L, uh, unit L2 ball, because again, the comparator can be written in this form, right? So this is the phi function now, except it's a phi function of vectors, not of uh, bits, right? We go from predicting bits to predicting vectors. Okay, so this is the last step of that problem that you want to solve. It's a min-max product, inner product, and, and the uh, Euclidean norm of the sum. Ew. So, uh, you know, we can solve it numerically, but to be able to show some uh, interesting statement, you need a closed form, right? So how do, we, how do we get a closed form? And there are a number of ways. Essentially, you need to relax this problem. You need to replace uh, this comparator, this phi function, by uh, some upper bound. And if we do that, you get, you know, uh, uh, hopefully not too bad of a relaxation, right? So you need something that's close to the norm. So how do you get something close to the norm? Well, the first kind of trivial thing to do is to put a square and take a square root, right? And, 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 and take, uh, take the last guy out, and then kill the, the quadratic part, right? So what was the problem here? Right, th th this was not a nice problem. You, you uh, 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 put square and, and square root, you would have the norm of the nabla n squared, and that would be an ugly optimization problem. But if you, if you know that they're bounded by, uh, uh, if they're in the unit ball, just replace it by one. It turns out that this already uh, gives you a closed form solution, and it, it, it's essentially some version of uh, dual averaging, right? It, it has a closed form solution, exact min max is of this form, so it is a, let me write it like, like this, so the intermediate steps, you take the average of the gradients of the nablas, they don't have to be gradients, right, uh, of some function, uh, and, and have a, um, this uh, step size. So the only difference is that the step size is kind of strange, right? It has the data that you've seen so far, you take the uh, squared norm of the sum and then a data independent part, right? But this is exact solution for that relaxation and there are many other relaxations that you can try. In particular, it guarantees that the bound is one over uh, squared of n. Actually, maybe there is some other constant there. 
Okay, so is that, yes. Isn't this basically similar to the other grad? Uh, not yet, because other grad um, doesn't have this um, the N minus R, right? So the reason it appears is because we have fixed a uh, horizon, and, and for if we're sitting at time t, um, we got rid of this future, uh, right? We can't have the uh, nablus for the future. But this way of proof uh, requires you to replace them by something. And the last step decision is exactly what other group. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, exactly. Okay, is this clear? Let's do exponential. How many people know the exponential weights algorithm or the multiplicative, you know, the weighted majority? Okay, so many. So let me show you that again. This is a just a relaxation. Uh, for that, we have to go to the different geometry, right? So a multiplicative weights is for distributions that suggest the L1 geometry. And if we take the primal dual approach with the balls, uh, it's, it's uh, either L1, L infinity setup or simplex and L infinity setup, right? So you can, you know, roughly up to a constant, these are the same. So what do we do for the last step? For the last step, you minimize over distributions, maximum over L infinity bounded uh, uh, vectors, linear part again, plus the maximum, right, of all the data uh, that, um, right? That's the last step. Again, intractable. What do we do? Relax it. And, and the natural way is to use a soft max. And that's what gives the exponential weights, the, 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 the multiplicative weights. Right? So for, uh, in fact, if, if you're free to choose eta, that's an equality, right? It's an infimum over eta, that would be equality. So the, uh, or, or eta is the step size that you choose. You can choose it later or you can choose it adaptively as you go. But this is the, uh, this is the relaxation and let's call it Zn, right? To remind you of the uh, log partition function. Okay, so you can write the inner product just to match the uh, the notation is a uh, one over eight a log exp. Okay, of course we haven't changed anything, right? That's equality. And uh, um, okay, if you if you stare enough at it, you'll you'll see that you, um, you can write z n in terms of the expected uh, um, uh, j from the exponential weights distribution, right? The one that uh, uh, puts the past gradients, exponentiates them for each coordinate. Okay. Now, if you plug this back in uh, into that optimization problem, it's 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 it becomes clear that uh, you will get this recursion going if you choose exactly that exponential weights distribution. It is not the min-max strategy, I believe, for that relaxation. It's a choice. Uh, but but that's you know that allows the recursion to go through, right? and so you you would get the uh, exponential weights algorithm, and here again the jump the the bound that you would get is log d over n, square root of log d over n. Yes. Is there any chance we can get randomized algorithms out of this technique? Yeah. Uh, uh, next. So, uh, what other uh, the question was uh, uh, whether we can get other algorithms out of this, like randomized algorithms. And, and there are plenty of algorithms that we've gotten uh, out of this way of thinking. Uh, one thing you can do is to relax uh, 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 with some LP norm for the experts. And that would lead to these uh, polynomial uh, uh, potential you know, uh, uh, algorithms. But another, way, uh, another one which is interesting is the uh, uh, is a randomization where you take, you add a, a random vector here, which is zero mean, and by Jensen inequality, it's upper bounded by expected max. Right. So if expectation were here, you would get, have a zero. As when you pull expectation out, it's a upper bound. So that's in a, 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 a relaxation, and now you can see that uh, um, um, with with pretty much simple algebra that this gives the randomized method, which is follow the perturbed leader for those who know the, the literature. This is due to um, uh, Kalai and Vimpala, uh, 2005 roughly, 
but actually has a history of going back to, uh, um, uh, to Hanan in the, in, the, in the 50s under the name of fictitious, uh, 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 smooth fictitious play where you look at the current performance of every expert and then you add noise to them and then pick the best. So that smooths the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the choices. Okay. So I think this is going to be my final slide. Um, I talked so far about the online linear optimization. And I, I guess, let me go back. Uh, this expert bound is an upper bound on rather macro complexity. It's still unclear whether we can get the actual Rademacher complexity as upper bound, or we can only get the upper bound on the Rademacher complexity. But when we go to the online uh, supervised learning setting with linear functions, then uh, we have a characterization of when we can get the, this desired bound. And again, this is a result that holds for all sequences, does not require the IID assumption, and it's essentially the best you can do even in the IID case, right? But now it's for all sequences. This is, again, attractive for uh, um, uh, uh, problems like networks, the, the, the matrix uh, completion problem where there is some interaction with the user. And, and so you just cannot assume that what you observe are IID data, right? So anytime you have some kind of uh, uh, interaction with a user in these online problems, um, it, it just can't treat it as IID, right? And so the hope is that if we can get these results, they will be more robust uh, to the behavior of the users uh, in, in, let's say, Netflix prediction and, and, and the, um, do not rely on the IID assumption. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, it turns out that there is another geometric uh, property of the space that Ben was uh, talking about. Uh, in addition to strong convexity, uh, or existence of a strongly convex function, there is another function that it turns out that has been studied very much uh, in, in, uh, to a great extent in, in probability theory, uh, and especially by Burkholder. It's called the special uh, Burkholder function. And if we have access to this function, then we have an efficient method for attaining this bound. And uh, it's, we still do not know whether how to construct this function for the spectral norm. So I, 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 I had, I, maybe I build up the expectation, you know, the, 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 I build up the, uh, the expectation that the, the, uh, there will be a result for matrix completion that for all sequences gives you an empirical Rademacher complexity. And it is true, so we know that it, it, it's possible, but we don't know what the efficient algorithm is because we don't know how to construct this function. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think it's a great kind of area now to explore uh, and, and come up with these uh, uh, um, uh, Burkholder functions that, we, that do give rise to efficient methods that give you essentially what is the best possible uh, for all sequences. Right? So, so we you know, just we need, know, to, we know, need to evaluate the Burkholder function? You just need to evaluate the Burkholder function. It's, I, I can show you. Just but it's more. defined as some sort of... It's, <laughs> <laughs> It, it just has to have this property. It has to dominate the difference of spectral norms, possibly to some power if you want. Uh, and it has to be diagonally concave. So this map has to be concave. But you know for the spectral norm that it exists. Yeah, right? We know it exists, yes. Yeah. Let, let me not leave that slide on because it <laughs> <laughs> looks scary. <laughs> so we, we, we know this is possible. Pretty much any problem that you care about, this will be possible. Uh, for efficient methods, the game is on. So we, we, we're still, uh, we have a bunch of results, but not, uh, not. Uh, uh, I, I should say that this is work with uh, Karthik Sritharan and uh, Dylan Foster. Um, any questions? Thanks. Um, how hard is it to actually compute that, that upper bound? Uh, so, so the question is how hard is it to compute the, the actual Rademacher complexity? Yeah. For the linear case, when, when you have a norm, it's, it's easier. Right? So it's average over random coin flips uh, of a norm of a random walk, right? 
Um, it concentrates with respect to the coin flip, so you can get approximate results. Um, so you have an upper bound on the upper bound, so it's uh, you have a concentration result, yeah. right? Yeah. And more generally? More generally, um, if you can do empirical risk minimization as a black box, I think you can evaluate the empirical, uh, evaluate the rather macro complexity. Beyond that, I, yeah, it depends on what kind of access you have to the function class, right? If you have. Uh, yes. uh, so so the, the no regression results you surely hold for adaptive adversity. Yes. The way that you wrote down the game was about the obligate adversity. No, actually, the, 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 way that we, um, uh, the way that we wrote down the game was actually for adaptive, right? Because so you, this choice can be made based on everything so but far. This is different from what you had in the previous slide. The, the notation was just getting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think what I, I, I yeah. messed up the notation on. On this slide, yes, exactly. because here I meant this is a strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you have to. Read it. I see. Thank you. Okay, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. And